think we're good. Cancer is when corrupted cells multiply uncontrollably. It can emerge from basically every type of cell in your body, so there's not just a single type of cancer, but hundreds. Yeah, this is kind of why, you know, defeating cancer is, you know, maybe near impossible. Others are deadly. In a sense, a cell that becomes cancer turns into something ancient and something new. Over billions of years, evolution has molded cells to survive and thrive in a hostile environment, fighting for space and resources, until a new and exciting way of life emerged. Yeah, I agree with you. The visuals are getting better, aren't they? This, this looks ne kind of next level. Corporation, a division of labor that allowed cells to special. Thought it could be fun. Have you got a picture of your car? My car got ridden off halfway through <laughs> last year. Um, <laughs> but damn. Wait, was yeah? Was, I thought that was your the family same week car. as my back surgery. Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe and my breakup. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard about what I built? By the way, just before we start. Oh no! I mean, I I. <laughs> I'm aware of AI cars. I've been watching your. Um, oh my god! People are using it. Look, but um, these are yes, random. These are tell random. Tell me about it. Cars. Oh, that's kind of nice. But uh, check out these, Finn. I don't know if you can see. Actually, yeah. You see what I mean? It's there's nice. really. Yeah, I... There's a good one down lower. I'm trying to find it. Check out this one. Look at that. Ooh, yeah. How unreal is that? It just completely changes the car. Anyway, let's get yeah. into a video, shall cool. we? So yeah, come check out AI My Cars. Your boy built it um, and building lots of fun things. ...and become more successful together. But cooperation requires sacrifices. For a multicellular being to stay healthy, the well-being of the collective has to matter more than the survival of the individual cell. Cancer cells stop being part of the collective and become individuals again. Your body can handle... A what even are we, man? Like, what are we? <laughs> a few rogue cells, but some... Just made of all these other life forms, and then we're this, we call it a life form, and it's like... ...the cells divide again and again, becoming a sort of new organism within you, taking resources you need to survive, competing for the space you inhabit, destroying the organs they were part of in the process. Despite the harm they cause, cancer cells are not evil. They don't want to hurt you. They don't want anything. Cells are protein robots that just follow their programming. That sounds great and all, but where does life stop? What is the boundary of life? Like, really think about this. How do you define life? Is it at the boundary of the cells? That's, that seems reasonable. But if you zoom in on that, where is the boundary? If you keep zooming in, you're going to get into physics-y stuff, and there's not really a boundary. So it's like, where does the boundary of life stop? It's It gets very unclear the deeper you look into this question now when you're in school it's like it's like super obvious you're like oh clearly life's just this animal over there which unfortunately has been corrupted the soul of the cell in a nutshell your cells hey, have a nucleus filled with dna it consists of genes instructions for how to build proteins and when to make each one these building instructions are copied and transferred to writing. They're, they're a smart bunch at Kozik, aren't they? They're using this kind of language that they know the general public will love. <laughs> like, you know, a scientist would never say such a thing, but this is the genius of Kozik, right? ...ribosomes where they're used to make proteins. What kind of proteins your cells make determine what they can do. The important thing here is that a corrupt gene means you get a corrupt protein, which will get important later. Your DNA gets a tiny bit corrupted. It mutates. I had the most fascinating discussion with a professor about a week ago. I was just hanging out, eating my pie, my Australian pie, right? And then I had a, I was laying on the ground, having a little nap. It was in a beautiful spot in the city. And it was like a nice view. And this dog runs over and starts barking in my face. And I think I'm getting attacked by a dog. I'm, I'm laying with my eyes closed and I look over and it's this dog who's like the size of a football <laughs> and then he runs off right and then he comes back like two minutes later with a ball sitting next to me <laughs> so I threw the ball and then he brought the ball back uh, anyway then so I started talking with the owner because he had a bitcoin shirt on so he started talking about bitcoin and politics and pretty much everything else <laughs> and then he turns out he's a professor of uh, exercise like sports science exercise physiology 
And the stuff he was telling me was blowing my mind about genes. Um, he, he was basically like a microbiologist. It was incredible. And he was telling me just such incredible stuff about uh, you know, the, the science coming out of what we know about genes and gene expression and how they change when you exercise and how they're not even looking now at how the genes change, but how the, the actual proteins you already have change, right? Because the genes code for the proteins that are already there. And so now they're starting to look at the proteins themselves to see how they change. And then, and then the, the gene expression changes as well on top of that. And there was, there was like five levels of complexity five layers there and they're all sort of intermixing and i was just like oh my goodness how are we ever going to be able to tell the public about this stuff <laughs> you know like if you look on the internet there's just no people need to speak in such simple language and what this guy was trying to explain was like this is really complicated it ju it's just so concerning and you know the, the world is just so much more complex we need to bring more of that back Tate, tens of thousands of times definitely will be a video preferably anonymous each day most of the time without any special cause just by being alive almost all of these mutations are fixed very quickly or are not problematic still over time as your cells make copies of themselves damage is accumulating imagine having to make copies from copies from copies for decades maybe one day a hair got on the scanner or a corner got frayed each new mistake becomes part of the new copies and all the copies that follow you can increase DNA damage by doing things like smoking, drinking alcohol, by being obese, breathing in asbestos, by not using sunscreen, or contracting a virus like HPV. But the simplest way to damage DNA and get cancer is to be alive long enough. For many cancer cases, there is no cause other than bad luck. Yeah, I've said this before many times. If you, I think the stat is, if you live to about 100, I think it's 130 years old, or 120, right? Um, you know, the cells in your body are replicated constantly. And if you were to get to 130, there would have been so much replication done that it's pretty much a statistical certainty at some point within that 130 years, you'd get cancer because it's just a random thing. And, you know, like a lot of people don't want to hear that there's randomness inherent to the universe. <laughs> they choose to believe, you know, they can do what they want and blah, blah, blah. Look, maybe, we don't know everything, for sure, and we don't know what consciousness is, but as far as we can tell, uncertainty is baked into the fabric of this place. And, uh, you know, this cancer stuff is a direct product of this uncertainty. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you, you, you likely will get cancer at some point in your life. And that just shows you, right? Because you think, oh, you might never have really thought about, oh, if I live to 90 or 80, there's not that good a chance of my cancer might not get cancer but if you live to 130 it's like you, you you very much should so you can see within that say 80 years of your life the chances of you getting cancer are quite like high right so this is if you're a young person out there watching this and you're kind of like oh this you know you're not thinking about this sort of thing just think about that you're very likely to get cancer within those 80 years of your life so we should all try and like do something about this and invest in the stuff the damage that leads to cancer we are simplifying but roughly there are three categories the of nuance genes that need to be correct the, the nuance to this sort of area um yeah there's always nuance like i said but what i said isn't isn't incorrect you know if you live to 130 there's so much replication happening it's just a statistical you know that it's bound to happen routed so cancer can arise the first key mutation is in the appropriately named tumor suppressor genes, or TSGs. These genes are a bunch of things. For one, they produce control mechanisms that continuously scan your DNA for mistakes and copying errors and fix them right away. And then they keep normal cells from multiplying recklessly. If TSGs become damaged, your cells basically forget how to repair themselves and can reproduce unchecked. The second crucial mutation can happen in your oncogenes. When oncogenes are turned on, the cell is told to multiply rapidly. They were super active when you were inside your mother's womb. To turn a single original cell into trillions in months, it needs to divide and grow rapidly. These rapid growth genes are turned off when there's enough of you. When your oncogenes get corrupted, they basically turn on again. The third crucial mutation is in your cell's suicide switch. 
Most cells are constantly recycled. That's a metal band right there. Old and refreshed. Suicide cell... switch. We're starting that band. Who wants to join? Cells amass too much damage, they usually notice, and special genes trigger a controlled suicide called apoptosis. If the genes that control this process get damaged, cells are free to live on despite being dangerously corrupted. So, if a cell becomes unable to fix the mistakes in its genetic code, loses the ability to destroy itself when it notices the damage, and begins to grow rapidly without restraint, it turns into a young cancer cell. These cells have to be killed as quickly as possible. While they are bad at this stage, they are still pretty weak and easy to kill. But if they continue to mutate and increase in number, they can learn to avoid your defenses and become a real threat. At any moment of your life, your immune system is hunting these cells. But how do you identify and kill corrupted cells that seem indistinguishable from healthy ones? How to find... So here's another little thing I said in the stream <coughs> fairly recently, but because this video is so relevant and it'll probably go on YouTube, like, you know, just the action of how sort of, um, you know, light from the sun can cause cancer. It's probably a mystery to a lot of people, but it's actually quite simple uh, if you know your stuff. So it's like, you know, you have these these photons, these rays, which is what makes up sunlight, right? And it comes, beams down to planet Earth and it hits your body sometimes. And what is your body made of? It's made of atoms, right? And what do we know about physics? Well, if you shoot photons, all right, and they have the, the right energy, when they hit your atoms that your body is made of, it's holding you together essentially, thanks to electromagnetism, um, these atoms, right, they have these configurations, okay, they have these electrons, let's say, around them in these certain energy states, these, these at, at certain energy levels, and the, let's say this energy level corresponds to like, you know, something like that, right? This is just to help you understand. So imagine this photon that's coming in has an energy level of exactly that. It can't be any more or any less. If it has an energy level of exactly that, well, guess what happens? What we, we know this happens, that this atom will just somehow absorb this photon. This, this photon is massless. That sort of, sort of needs to be said. But anyway, so this, this atom will just, the, the photon will disappear, right? And we say the, this atom has absorbed the photon, right? And what happens is that energy level of the, say, the electron, it jumps up an energy level. And then the orbital, which is the area around the atom the electron can be found in, has a probability of being found in, even though it's non-zero everywhere in the universe, um, it, it changes its pattern. And it can be like a, configure, a figure eight, it can be all these wacky shapes, right? And you know what happens then? Well, at some spontaneous point in the future, that energy level drops back down, right? So the orbital changes back to its ground state. And the, the, so the, the, the orbital changes shape, right? and um, it randomly shoots off a photon, the atom, at some random point in the future, just shoots off a photon. So, think about this, what I've just said, in the human body, right? You're walking around, and then this stray photon just hits you in the face. <laughs> and it hits one of your atoms, right? And it fundamentally changes the atom into like, into, it changes its structure. Like, if you, if you did basic chemistry, right, you would know that if you're changing the amount of electrons uh, or, or things in an atom, it changes the atom and even p potentially the, the element and the molecule. That's not good <laughs> because you're being held together by these atoms and these elements and these molecules. And if you just start changing them, what do you think happens? You, you fall apart essentially, right? Now that's not really what's happening. You're not falling apart. You're made of trillions of them. But it, it really is at the very small scale. Find cancer. Well, here we come back to the protein. And like, just, just so everyone knows, the way I explained it as well is still a simplification. And there's still so much more nuance there. Uh, and, but, but that shouldn't get you down, right? That was pretty much close to what we think is going on. So I hope that doesn't make you feel like, geez, like too much complexity, I can't do any of this. Don't think like that, my man. You can, you can do this. This is why this this is why scientists right go into the very specialized fields and they spend their whole lifetime on this one little question, this tiny little question, because there's too much complexity there for any one human to look at it all. All right, 
you've got to have courage and you've, you've got to know how science works. If you're going into science, you can only really hope to, to add a little, you know, leaf on a branch, some, you know, massive tree. So you, you really shouldn't hope to, you know, solve the whole thing. It's, it's kind of silly. Uh, and I'm just saying this because that's how science is done. And most people are so disconnected from this and they don't understand this. And it needs to be stated more. But we also need science communicators to have courage to be willing to talk about things. Otherwise, think about what happens. You just get morons who think they know things, talking about things, and they don't know anything. Now you might think, it's like, who would you rather talk about things? Morons who don't know anything and have a lot of confidence, or someone who's gone at least deep into one little question, and then they can kind of extrapolate and map it, the scientific speculation onto other areas. You, know, you see what I mean? So it's like, so many scientists are unwilling to do that, because they know how many pitfalls there are doing that, and how silly that can be. I get it. But we can't be like that if we're going to, you know, not self-destruct as a civilization. We need scientists to start communicating and talking about all science. I'm so sick of dumbass scientists around the world thinking, you know, we just, you know, everyone should stick to their lane. If we did that, like, think about what happens. Just no one's thinking about it. You have scientists who only talk about their one little thing, and that's it. And so no one's connecting knowledge anywhere. And then you, who's connecting the knowledge? The morons. But you know, I don't want to say any names here. I don't want to bring politics into it. But you get what, you get what I'm getting at. As your cells produce and the story they tell. So if, for example, your oncogenes switch back on, they make oncogene proteins. Your immune system knows that they should not be present if you're an adult. So to know which cells are corrupt and which are healthy, your immune system needs to know what proteins they're making inside. To solve this, evolution came up with MHC class 1 molecules, a sort of display window that makes cells transparent. Cells constantly take little samples of the proteins they make and put them into thousands of these MHC molecules to showcase what they're doing. So what happened there, guys? Sorry, it's the sound. So they must have a copyrighted uh, song on this one, which is sad because it means we probably can't watch the rest. Uh, but we talked about a lot anyway. We got, we got a lot out of that. Love this. I don't want to say person. It, it, I say person because it's a male voice, right? And obviously it's a team of incredible people. But guys, that'll be all she wrote for today.